appreciate very much the presence of everyone here. We have a number who are visiting with us. We're thankful for your being here and hope that you feel welcome and will come back and be with us at any opportunity you have. I may sound a little muffled. I feel a little bit weak, but it, it much improved. So uh, bear with me. I'll probably sound worse than I actually am. So bear with me. Focus in on the words that we'll be talking about. The thoughts. Uh, as you see on the screen, how can we restore New Testament Christianity today? That's been a question that we've asked Many people are not asking that question, and they should be. We all should be asking that question continually because it's probably the most important question for religious people, especially people who would claim to believe in Jesus Christ. You're going to take the same Jesus that the apostles presented to us in the New Testament then you've got to always be determining, am I staying with that same Jesus or am I kind of adjusting him to modern age and modern philosophy, human philosophy and that kind of thing. A lot of people take a, the concept of a Jesus and then kind of tweak it and make Jesus the thing that changes through the years. But the Hebrews writer says that he's the same yesterday today and forever. So you don't tweak him. You don't change him. You don't change his will. What you do is adjust yourself to him. And when we do that, then we're always asking ourselves, am, am I in the same mode? Am I in the same uh, thought, uh, general thought of, of thinking, uh, same kind of faith, uh, possessing the same kind of doctrinal positions that you can see in the apostles of the New Testament? Do we reflect that? Or have we manipulated that a little bit and adjusted it and made it a little bit something different through the years? As you can see on the screen, you can look at the first century church. You can read about it in the New Testament. As you read in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, the, uh, Paul said uh, what he taught to one church, he taught that to all the churches. So all of them had the same basic teaching. They all taught the same thing. They all looked alike. They just were in different locations. And so that's the way it should be now. But it, as you look at the scene that has developed from the first century to now, then you see a lot of differences that concern us and should concern us. And you wonder, in the midst of all that, here in the year 2015, isn't that amazing? To me, as I look at my lifetime, I never thought I'd make it to 2015. It just seemed like when I was growing up, that was so far into the future that uh, everybody would be riding spaceships <laughs> and that kind of thing. Uh, you'd have your own personal uh, helicopter uh, to go from your house to work. And it, you just had concepts as a child that way back in 2015, you'd really be, it'd be a different world. And it is. There's a lot of different things that we've seen. Those who are older than me can say, well, I've seen more changes than you have seen. And that's true. Uh, but I'm just saying that, that there's a lot of changes that have taken place as far as uh, conveniences and contraptions and different things, different uh, devices that we can use. But some things do not change. They, are, they ought not to change. For example, the gospel in the first century when they added circumcision to it, he says, you were removed from the gospel we preached. And so that's not the gospel we preach. You adding that to it changed it. So in Galatians 1 he says, I'm, I'm surprised that you've removed from him who called you to the grace of Christ to another gospel. See that gospel that was originally preached ought to be the same one. In every way it should look the same. In every age it should look the same. In Luke chapter 8 verse 11 Jesus talked about the parable of the sower that went forth to sow. And the seed that was planted in the hearts was the Word of God. 
And if you preached and, and taught and you learned the very same Word of God that was preached in the first century, it ought to produce the same thing in the 20th, 21st century. Here we are in 2015, and we've got to ask ourselves some serious questions. How do we look at the landscape of the world, and especially the alterations, uh, the manipulations the divisions, and then come out thinking that it is even possible to be a Christian in the same sense as they were in the first century. I know we're going to wear different outfits, we're going to be different styles of things and different devices that we will have, but the concept of the, uh, of the same faith, the same hope, The same principles, the same values, the same foundation upon which to build your life. All of that ought to be the same. And it can be. And if it was possible to be a Christian without being in a sect or in a denomination in the first century, and it was. You can't look at Paul and say he was... I know that outsiders would call him a member of the sect of the, sect, uh, of the Pharisees or, or the Nazarenes. But that was their false concept. He wasn't a member of a sect. But people perceived that he was. But he knew that he was not. And that's got to be the case now that if he could be in the body of Jesus Christ without being a part of some sect of the religion of Jesus Christ, then it's possible in this century to be a Christian only. That is, you are not tied to anything that separates you from anything that characterized Paul or Peter or the early Christians. So that here in 2015... I have to believe that if you could be such a Christian as they were in the first century, if you could be that in the first century, it ought to be possible. And we must make it probable and factual that we can be an undenominational Christian in the same sense that they were. We read of one thing in the first century in the Bible that ought to be the case through all the centuries, but we see a lot of changes, a lot of manipulations. And we ought to see how to get past those manipulations, get back to the pure form of Christianity. We see in the early church an entirely different thing from what you see developing and and evolving from, say, the third century on to now to modern sectarianism. But if the same gospel is pure, it will produce the same thing as it did in the first century. Now with that in mind, I'd like us to think in terms of what I'm not talking about. I'm not saying that the Lord's church has ever been lost. And now we've got to restore it to the world because it's been lost. Now, the Lord's church is not what has been lost. It is people that have been lost. Uh, think of it this way, and I'm turning, I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 12. And I want you to notice the nature of the kingdom of God. In Matthew 16, 18, Jesus talked about the church that he would build and on this foundation, this this rock, the church would be built. And he says, I'm going to give you, Peter, the keys of the kingdom. He's kind of using church and kingdom in an interchangeable way. So that you're talking about the same people, the same people that are called out of the world are called into the kingdom. So the church is not lost People are lost. 
The church is people who are not lost. That's the way it's got to be. That's the way it has been. And that's the way it always will be. Look at Hebrews chapter 12 and let's look at verse 27. Now this, yet once more, and he's quoting from the Old Testament where the prophecy had been made that there would be something that would be shaken one, one time. I shake the earth and heaven in order to pro- provide something that would be stable for all time. So now this yet once more thing that I've mentioned here indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as of things that are made that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. In in Daniel, he talked about the kingdom of God would be set up in the days of these kings, and it would be an un, it would be a kingdom that would uh, not be left to other people. You couldn't take take it over. You couldn't you couldn't uh, run over that kingdom and and change hands. And this is an unshakable kingdom. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom, verse 28, which cannot be shaken, therefore the kingdom of God is not something that is lost. People lose their way to it, and they lose their way from it, but it stays the same. And so it is not a shakable kingdom. The church is not lost. It is fixed in place. People can move themselves in to Christ or out of Christ, but they cannot move Christ and his kingdom. They cannot move his church. They can move themselves from his church, from his body, But they can't move the body. It's fixed in place. It always has been. It always will be. It is an everlasting kingdom. We do not restore the church. And we can restore ourselves to God and thus restore to the visual to the vision of people around us that the kingdom of God has come through his heart and her heart and it is here seen in their lives but you do not move the kingdom any which way. We restore our hearts to God. We restore ourselves to God through his provisions of power. We restore our hearts to God by being converted to God. Without being converted to God, our hearts are still far from God and the kingdom of God is not within us, but we haven't affected the kingdom of God. We've just affected whether we're going to be a part of it or not. So the church is not lost, and it has never been lost, and the church is not something that we do the restoring of. What we can restore is our hearts to God so that the kingdom of God can be in us, and his church will be seen through us and in us, and that's possible. What God does is he uses restored people, people that, he's, that have been restored all the way to him. You don't just restore part of, the, part of their way to God, but they are fully, they, they've removed all the debris. It's like Jesus said, or John the Baptist taught, make straight your paths to him. The things that are crooked in your path to God, get it out of the way. 
Get all the mountains out of the way. Anything that stands in the way, get all the debris out of the way. Anything that does not allow you to be fully restored to God, get that out of the way. Now, that's, that's doable. That's something that we have power to do or not do. Jesus uses restored people to advance his kingdom to others. In other words, if it's going to be the case that we're going to be New Testament Christians, it's going to be one heart at a time, my heart and your heart, one heart at a time. And then God can use us to advance it to other people. But if it's not within us, then we've got to be restored to God. You see the point? That this rock upon which uh, the church is built, that rock hasn't moved. We can move ourselves off of the rock. We can put ourselves on the rock by believing in Jesus Christ. But we don't move the rock. The rock is going to stay where it's always been. So now let's think of in terms of restoring our hearts to God. In 2015, the world is going to need this. Our children are going to need this. Our grandchildren are going to need this. Our friends, our co-workers, they're going to need somebody that takes a stand for what's right. And then they can say, well, that person takes a stand for what's right. But you can't take a stand for what's right until you have your heart restored to God. Now let's think in terms of what it would take to restore New Testament Christianity into our own lives. It would take a completely new way of thinking. And I want you to turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. While you're turning to there, I'm going to wet my whistle. <clears throat> Romans 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, in other words, I'm pleading with you because it really is up to you. But I'm pleading with you not just based upon your own wisdom, your own strength. I'm pleading with you by the mercies of God. I'm pleading with you that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. It's hard for us to think in terms of being a sacrifice. But something has got to to give. Something has got to be given up. And your body has got to be a sacrifice that is a living sacrifice. I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not asking you to go uh, to be a, 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 a death sacrifice. I want you to be a sacrifice that's very much alive. But you are a sacrifice. And I want you to be a holy sacrifice. I want you to be acceptable to God which is your reasonable service. Anything less than that will not do. Now, if we got that in place, look at the things that would take place. If that became uh, true of us, then this would be the thing that would flow out of that, verse 2. You would not look like the world. You would not conform to the world. It would not even be important to you to be like the world. You wouldn't want to be like the world because the world doesn't know where they're going. You know where you're going. You know what your mission is. They don't. And so you know that you're not to conform to this world. You don't conform to what their values are. You don't conform to what their principles are. You don't look like them in the way that you act, the way you talk the way you present yourself, you don't conform. But here's what does take place. And here's where the kingdom of God can show itself in us, is that we become transformed by the renewing 
of your mind. And this is the way you think. This is not the way the world thinks, but this is the way you think. This is a transformed mindset. It is a mindset that says that I am going to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It is my mindset is now what is the will of God and can I put that to the test and prove that this is the will of God. And can I exemplify it, put the will of God into practice so that I'm proving it in that way? A transformed mindset means that I'm going to be looking for ways to exemplify the will of God. That's what Jesus was all about. So it must be the case that if we're going to be the church of our Lord in the 20. First century, in the year 2015, every one of us have got to be transformed in the way that we think. And we must not be conformed. It's got to be a mindset that seeks to prove what is acceptable to the Lord. That's what made first century Christianity what it was. That's what will make 21st century Christianity, what it will be. This is the result of, of, of being confer, restored to God, converted to God and restored to God. And when that is the case, it will result in us doing things decently in order and trying to find ways to make sure that what we're doing is right and acceptable unto God. That's part of the results that people should see in us because we are devoted to doing the will of God. Restore your heart. Restore the way you talk, too. Sometimes we get into denominational jargon, things that were, were, maybe we grew up hearing it as members of a denomination, and they kind of filter over into the way that we talk. Peter says... If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. That means talk like the oracles of God talks. Speak like the oracles of God speak. Sometimes we use language that does not reflect biblical concepts. For example, somebody asks you, what denomination are you? What do you say? Well, that's not a biblical concept. So if you fit right in, if you go right in and say, well, I know what he's thinking. And I really don't have time to explain to them. Sometimes it might be good just to leave a a biblical thought. Instead of just leaving it, that might be your opportunity. It might be a good time to say, well, just tell you the truth. I believe we all ought to be anti-denominational. I mean, we ought to be against being a denomination. Don't you think? Everybody ought to be. That's the apostles were. They said, let there be no divisions. They were against it. So when somebody asks you what denomination, if you just... You just throw out a term to to satisfy that. You might be losing opportunity. I, I think I've done that too many times. If we start talking biblically, maybe we can get people thinking biblically. I believe in being non denominational, and I also believe in being anti denominational. That is against denominationalism. And so, therefore, I'm just going to try to be a Christian like they were in the first century. What denomination were they members of? And they will say, I never thought about that. Well, maybe we all think about it some more. If they weren't in a denomination in the first century, then we ought not to be in one in the 21st century. 
we ought to restore the biblical heart and then the results will be the biblical talk of the first century Christian and that same faith being in the 21st century Christian. This will get us away from denominational language. Uh, Where is your church? And usually people think in terms of a church building. Let's think in terms of us being the spiritual building and that we might gather at a particular uh, location, which is fine. They gathered at a certain location in the first century. That's fine. But don't think of the church building as the church. It's not. The church building is just the place where the church gathers to meet. We are the church. The church are the called people. They're called by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now restore that to your heart. Restore to your mind the concept of being a disciple of Jesus Christ, a learner, and his church being the people who have been called out of the world. And then we'll talk like that. And if we talk like it more, then we will open more doors. Now, you can go about it wrongly. You can do it in a, in a way that's not uh, uh, very nice. But you can also do it in a way that is nice. And so I'm just simply saying uh, we don't have to hammer people over the head. We don't have to be ugly in some way. But we can use an opportunity to get people to think that here... We are in the 21st century here in the year 2015 and if we're not opening doors by by taking a stand for truth and being a light, then we'll never be a light. And we need to be a light. This will also get us away from unscriptural concepts. Use biblical talk. Let's restore to ourselves the biblical language that will restore to the world better concepts of what the church of our Lord has always been about. And then there's one other thing, another thing. We have to restore the same kind of faith. I I know I'm talking, the first part of this, I'm talking about the content of your faith has got to be the right content so that you're talking the right content and you're doing the right things. But in this case, I want to talk about the kind of faith in the sense of the depth and quality of it. See, there's a content. You can believe all the right facts, but you don't believe them with with enough depth, with enough conviction that would carry you into the role of being noteworthy, that is, somebody that stands out from the world, that, that you're, you look different, that you, you seem different, that, that you, you possess different qualities, that I, I, I noticed that you didn't, you didn't go to that party and join in with others in drinking, and, and I noticed that you didn't laugh at the vulgar words that were used in that particular joke. You know, those are things that, you, that make people take note, that you've got some convictions. Well, here in Hebrews chapter 10, notice with me verse 32. Here's the kind of faith that we've got to restore to ourselves. I'm looking in Hebrews chapter 10. Let me get back in the right book. Hebrews chapter 10, look at verse 32. But here's, a, here's some brethren, Hebrew brethren, apparently in Jerusalem area. Persecution has arisen and they're getting discouraged and the quality of their faith seems to be dying out. You can tell that the writer is very concerned about that. And he wants them to think about their original quality of faith. 
Look at verse 32. But recall, I want you to think back to the former days in which after you were illuminated, that is, the light turned on and you understood the gospel and you understood the significance of it and you understood your need of it, the light came on, you were illuminated. At that time when you were really illuminated, You endured a great struggle with sufferings, partly while you were made a spectacle both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. That is, you you didn't feel embarrassed that, you know, they were treating Peter shamefully, and, and I just want to keep my distance from Peter because... I don't want people to get the idea that I'm just like him. But actually what you did is you were saying, hey, Peter, I believe the same thing Peter believes. And I'm not ashamed of believing the same thing Peter believed. And if you treat him that way, you're going to treat me that way. You know, that's, you were willing to be companions at that time Willing to be companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me and my chains. And you thought, Paul, Paul is having to suffer. We cannot let Paul suffer by himself. You had compassion on me and my chains. You were not embarrassed that I was thrown into jail. Look at that. If if he had been acting right, he wouldn't have been thrown into prison. I can see it today that a lot of us will say, I'm just totally embarrassed that we've got a preacher that's thrown in jail. Not if he's thrown in jail because he's teaching the truth. You had compassion on me in my chains and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods. They'd come into your houses and they'd plunder your house. Why? Because they're... They're trying to intimidate you and, in, and persecute you, knowing that you, have, you, you took all of that because you knew you had a better and enduring possession. That's the way you looked at it. You said, well, I can take that because I know I've got something better. Well, see, that's the quality of faith that they had. And he's saying, hey, you've got to get back to it. And that's what we've got to get back to. Brethren, if there was a time in your heart when you were spiritually on fire, you've got to get back to that. If there was a time when you were closer to the Lord and to his people than you are now, you've got to get back to it. Recall the former days. Go to the, to the best time of your faith. Go to the greatest moment of your faith, not to the weakest moment. So if we're going to restore New Testament Christianity in the year 2015, this is our year, brethren. This is the only one, and we don't know how much of it we have. But we're here, and this is the year that we've got to restore our hearts to God. Give Him the very best. I mean, let everything else go. There's nothing more important to this. Restore that quality of faith, that content of faith. This will get us to being noted for our priorities. People will see the Lord's church seems to be more important to him than anything. Well, that's the way it ought to be, shouldn't it? It ought to be more important to us than anything. And people ought to learn that. People around us that, uh, that work with us, that go to school with us, that people that, are, that we talk to, that we interact with, that these people ought to know that there's something about them that they think the church is so important to them. Well, it's because they believe that the church is what Jesus died for. And he purchased it with his own blood. It was so important to Jesus, it's got to be important to his people. 
So restore that kind of faith. And then let's do this as a final note. There's not a single one of us that can't do what I've just mentioned. Restore the I can outlook. Do you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm about to say when I say that. That Philippians chapter 4 verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, is an I can attitude that possessed the heart of the Apostle Paul so that he could withstand even the uh, the torment of his seclusion from the world, for from the brethren, his isolation. He could take whatever was dished out to him because he believed that his strength did not come from himself, but it came through Jesus Christ. If I keep my faith connected to him, the resource of my faith faith in him will bring back the resources into my heart that will give me the power to endure. What I'm saying in all of this is New Testament Christianity is up to you and it's up to me. And we can do it. Just as surely as it could be done in the first century, it can be done now. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me and that pushes us into action. When Paul was in prison, some brethren were thinking, well, that's the end of Paul. Poor old Paul, he's not going to be able to do anything. Then he writes Philippians and he says, you know what? What happened to me turned out to the furtherance of the gospel. It was because he had that I can spirit that there are no limitations except what you limit yourself to. There are no limitations to this church except what we place upon ourselves. So the results ought to be that starting right now, a local church that's united with a mission, we are going to be the church of our Lord, Jesus Christ. Do you understand what that means? A local church united with a mission, with a, with a common passion and a common order because we are ordering ourselves under the will of God. It will result in this church being a powerful, unstoppable influence for good in this society, in this community. We can't change politics. We can't change the world politically. We can't change much of those kinds of things. But what we can change is starting from the inside. We can change ourselves. And as people see us changing ourselves into the image of Christ, we begin to be like a a leaven in the community. And we start being a leaven for good and influence People wondering, what is it that makes you tick? What makes you happy? What makes you full of joy? How do you handle those things so well? It's because we've got a common mission, a common purpose. We become a force for the spread of the truth. We talk about it. We think about it constantly. It's on our mind because it's in our heart. And therefore, it comes out our mouths. It's like Paul wrote to the Corinthians. He says, I believe, therefore I speak. One has to follow the other one. I I have to talk about it because I believe it. And that's the way it ought to be with us, Brandon. We've got to be people who are influencing the society. We've got to be a force for truth. Nobody else is going to hold up the truth. We've got to be the truth holders. You have got to be dedicated to God in helping the church grow stronger. And here this year, I'm hoping that each one of us will make up our mind 
that we're going to do our part to make the Lord's church strong, stronger than it's ever been. We want people to know that we love the Lord and we love each other. And we love their souls and would love to have them to be converted to the Lord in the same way. You, dedicated to God, restored to God, restored to his will, helping his church grow stronger, not weaker. You not being the weak link in the chain, but a strong link in the chain. Every one of us doing our part. I hope that we'll make this year a great year for restoration to God, restoration of priorities to God, restoration of principles to God, restoration of values to God, restoration of obedience to God, restoration of faith, hope, and love to God. And I hope these are not just empty words that we just dismiss and forget about. They're not. They're very powerful. But the power is in what we do with them. And I hope that we'll begin today. If you need to obey the gospel of Christ, it begins with a heart restored to God. And if we can help you in your obedience to the gospel this morning,